Dan Laird, thanks for joining us. Uh, let's start this way. So you are you are in a unique position. You're both an attorney and a pain management physician. So you're you're up on both the legalities and the, and the health consequences of opioid policies and laws. Can you give me a, a broad sense and overview of whether things are moving in a right direction of, on behalf of pain patients or, or wrong direction? Uh, thanks, George. I'm, I'm happy to be here. It, kind of both it would be the answer to your question. Uh, chronic pain patients are uh, basically in a fight for their lives. Uh, they've been under attack for several years now with this uh, anti-opioid sentiment and sort of the overreaction to the opioid crisis. But there have been a couple of recent court cases that are quite substantial uh, and significant. One is uh, from the Supreme Court of the state of Oklahoma, and another one is a court case from Orange County, California, where the courts have rejected uh, this negligence th theory of uh, liability, which is based on uh, public nuisance. Chronic pain patients are just kind of the collateral damage in this huge multi-billion dollar litigation that's going on against the pharmaceutical companies, the opioid manufacturers. Yeah, they've got these, uh, you know, I don't know how many hundreds, maybe even thousands of jurisdictions, states, cities, counties, have all sued the big bad pharmacy companies. And of course, I am no big defender of the pharmacy companies, but uh, the allegation that they have caused this ongoing uh, opioid crisis, which has resulted in millions of legitimate pain patients being denied medication that keeps them alive, it keeps them going, is, is incorrect, right? It is largely incorrect. Don't get me wrong, there are bad doctors who overprescribe and that's been the case more in the past than it is now. Prescribed opioids are now at a 20 year low or approaching a, a 10 year low, I'm sorry, approaching a 10 year low and opioid deaths are higher than they've ever been in the history of the world. They have gone through the roof and the reason is because of this illicit fentanyl that's being smuggled into the United States by China and Mexico. And but the litigation narrative, the, the narrative that the, the trial lawyers want to push is that it's prescribed opioids that are causing all of these deaths. They continuously preach this narrative and the problem is the collateral damage, which is chronic pain patients who can't access opioids when appropriate. Opioids are dangerous drugs. They must be used with extreme caution they must be used as only a last resort, but they have a place in our culture, in acute pain, certainly, and in chronic pain, in cancer pain, in sickle cell pain. And there's been an overreaction that has been extremely harmful to chronic pain patients. But the courts are starting to see through the smoke and mirrors that's been going on for the last few years, I think. You've, you've been treating chronic pain patients for a number of years. You know the kinds of hoops they have to jump through in order to keep their their prescriptions. You also know about the risks of uh, becoming uh, dependent or uh, addicted to these pain meds. The studies that I have seen and read show that about 1% or less of pain patients in long-term pain management programs become what you would call addicted to the meds, which is, that is not the story that is reported in mainstream media, right? Oh, that's true. Yes. Um, one of the organizations that, uh, is constantly pushing this, this basically false narrative at this point that prescription opioids are the cause of the opioid epidemic is an organization called PROP. Uh, and and they're call, they call themselves Physicians for Responsible Opioid Prescribing. What they don't tell the public is that several members of their board of directors are basically professional expert witnesses for trial lawyers suing opioid companies. For example, uh, one person, Andrew Kolodny, who is a psychiatrist with no formal postgraduate training in pain management, uh, is an expert witness for, uh, in the Oklahoma case, against Johnson & Johnson Pharmaceuticals. His expert witness fee for that case uh, reportedly is $500,000. So it's pretty good work if you can get it. But the problem with that kind of narrative is that governments, uh, legislators, government regulators 
have started making it so difficult for chronic pain patients that they can't access uh, the medication they need. And so it's really created a problem for chronic pain patients. So that guy, that doctor is getting $500,000 to testify in these cases that sue the big drug companies, which are soaked for tens of millions of dollars in some of the verdicts that we've seen. He was also involved in writing the policies for CDC that set this whole thing in motion, right? Well, it's it, we believe that may be the case. Uh, he has definitely had an influence. That, that organization, PROP, has had an influence on the CDC guidelines that were so harmful to patients. There is an increasing amount of medical evidence that the consequences of those guidelines resulted in a number of chronic pain patients being destabilized, a number who turned to street drugs. And in this day and age, when you turn to street drugs, you, there's a very good chance that you'll die because the street drugs have been contaminated with fentanyl. And some unfortunately have suicided and we've, it's, it's really created a difficult problem. Another one of the prime uh, expert witnesses is a psychiatrist from California named uh, Anna Lemke. And here's what, I'll just read you this little excerpt from the court case in, in California. Uh, prescribing and administering con controlled substances for pain are legitimate if prescribed for a medical purpose. Prescribing should be done in the context of a diagnosis and documentation of unrelieved pain as part of the physician, uh, the doctor-patient relationship. Dr. Lemke testified that one in four patients prescribed opioids would become addicted. And here's what the judge says. As defendants point out, the studies relied upon by Dr. Lemke for that conclusion are inadequate to support it. The more reliable data would suggest less than 5% rather than 25%. And the numbers that I think are reliable show that it's less than 1%. If 25% of the people who are exposed to an opioid became addicted, we would be overrun with opioid addicts everywhere. There's about 30 million people who get surgery in the United States every year. And I would say most of them would get an opioid as part of their general anesthetic or regional type anesthetic. So these numbers, they just push these false numbers. And, and now you have courts of law calling them out. And, and so this is a very significant development and an exciting development for chronic pain patients. Yeah, the, the language was pretty pretty harsh, pretty strong in that case yes. and the Oklahoma cases. Exactly, exactly. So and, what kind of message does that send? Does that reverberate? Does that is that message being heard? Are pain doctors hearing it? Well, these cases are so new, I don't think it's had a chance to disseminate among the, the medical profession, but I can tell you the chronic pain advocates who are active on social media and nationally are well aware of these two cases, and it is giving, giving us some hope. Um, but I wanted to tell you, George, that in the, the introductory paragraph that the justice in the, of the Supreme Court of the Court of uh, State of, of Oklahoma, he wrote in the opening paragraph of his opinion, uh, some important things about pain. And he baked into that is I think a very important, some very important language for chronic pain patients to understand. And what he said was with regard to opioid, the opioid epidemic, uh, it is a persistent and costly health condition and opioids, I'm sorry, let me start over. Sure. Few deaths occurred when individuals use pharmaceutical opioids as prescribed. We also cannot disregard that chronic, the, that chronic pain affects millions of Americans. It is a persistent and costly health condition and opioids are currently a vital treatment for pain. The US Food and Drug Administration has endorsed properly managed medical use of opioids taken as prescribed as safe, effective pain management and rarely addictive. That's what the court found. So the attorneys defending Johnson & Johnson and some of these other opioid manufacturers did a good job of getting the science to the judge. But what the judge said, the Oklahoma Supreme Court justice said was, it's currently, opioids are currently used to, cre to treat chronic pain. And I take that as a message to chronic pain patients to scream louder. In other words, we, we have to be even more aggressive about establishing the fact that 
while the vast majority of chronic pain patients don't need opioids, there are a small number, a small percentage, who need to have access to these medications. And I, I just am, what I'm concerned about is that they will continue this narrative to the point that opioids are not considered an appropriate treatment for uh, chronic pain. And that battle is going on right now. And chronic pain patients have a, a, an important mission ahead of them. There have been people like you who early on saw this coming. And, uh, and I think the fact that chronic pain advocates have been so vocal has been so important because they're breaking through this false narrative that prescription opioids are bad in all circumstances. You know, there are people dying of opioids out there. There are, it's fentanyl that's, that's hit the streets. There's uh, heroin that's uh, in, it's everywhere. It's found everywhere. There's no shortage of heroin or fentanyl anywhere in the country. So much so that you hear heroin addicts saying, gosh, I miss the good old days when we could get heroin and not fentanyl. Those, there, those people are dying, but they are not in pain management programs. There are tens of millions of Americans who need opioids. It works for them. It's worked for humans for, and in medicine for a couple thousand years. It allows them to live normally, have a job, take care of their kids. And chronic pain, well, you're the doctor, you tell me, it doesn't get better. I mean, sometimes it'll get better, but in generally it, it can continue to get worse. Most of the patients, I mean, are older Americans who have a series of, of problems, right? That's exactly right. And I, I, I was so curious about this Oklahoma case that I, that I looked up the judge who wrote this opinion and he is an older man. And I wondered, uh, did, did that, you know, I, I don't think he made his decision based on his personal circumstances, but I think older Americans are more aware of this uh, chronic condition. Chronic pain affects between 50 and 100 million Americans, up to a third of Americans have chronic pain. And of course, the vast, vast majority do not require opioids, but there are a small group of people for whom opioids do work. They increase the function. They, the opioids can allow them to have a job, can allow them to recreate with their family, increase their quality of life, and they do have a role. Uh, like everything else in life, extremism one way or another is usually not the answer. A moderate approach uh, that addresses the issues. The rule is put the patient first. Put the rule, put the needs of the patient ahead, every, ahead of every other concern. And, you, and, and as a doctor, you'll do the right thing. What, what is so unfortunate about this false narrative is that if, if you'll notice, the, the huge upswing in opioid deaths has occurred because of fentanyl, yet they continue to, to pound this drum that it's prescription opioids causing the, the, the deaths. And the reason they are is because this is being driven by litigation. The, the people involved in this aren't talking about millions of dollars they're talking about billions and billions of dollars. So if it hurts a few chronic pain patients in the, uh, if they're collateral damage, you know, I guess they look at it as you've got to break a few eggs to make an omelet. But my job and the job of other pain physicians is to do what's in the best interest of the patient, not what's in the best interest of the trial lawyers. You know, I've seen the statistics and I've talked to the patients as you do on a, on a daily basis about what the crackdown has meant to their lives. Those who are completely cut off of these meds, and there are a lot of them out there, face terrible consequences. I mean, there is now a documentable link between tapering off and cutting off uh, chronic pain patients from their meds and suicide. Am I correct? Absolutely. And, and it's happened here in Nevada where, where doctors, uh, because of the, the regulation and the, the legislation that's been implemented the draconian measures, doctors become afraid, pharmacists become afraid that if they fill a prescription, they're going to get in trouble. If the doctor prescribes an opioid, they're going to get in trouble. So there have been circumstances, and, it, and it's occurred a lot, where patients have been abruptly tapered or had their opioid medication discontinued, and the patient who is then struck with a combination of severe and immediate opioid withdrawal combined with unmanageable, excruciating pain, and then they, 
they 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 use the term they suicide they use suicide as a verb but they they commit suicide and it's so tragic and so unnecessary you know people in your line of work doctors physicians uh just stop prescribing it uh you know general practice physicians do not prescribe opioids anymore you know although you know they could they would be certainly useful uh in certain cases surgeons don't want to give pain medication after surgeries uh, people often don't find that out until they go into the surgery and they come out and then they're in pain. Um, but that, that's a very good point. Um, always check with, find out what your surgeon's philosophy is about pain management before you have the knee replacement or the hip replacement or the gallbladder or, out or the, the hysterectomy. Because as you point out, this anti-opioid hysteria has now crept into uh, ERs and ORs. So you show up at the ER with a broken arm and the ER doctor is afraid to prescribe you opioids and wants to give you uh, intravenous toradol or, or some non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, which may have a role, to, but not to the exclusion of opioids. You're, if you're a sickle cell patient having an acute vaso-occlusive crisis, you may show up at the ER and the doctor won't give you pain medicine, opioid pain medication. Uh, same with surgeries. It's it's just created a, re a really terrible circumstance. Even cancer patients are being denied opioid pain medication for fear of addiction. It's just silly. Hospice patients. Hospice. Yes. It's gone. Yeah, can't have those people. Yeah, you can't risk having them get addicted. What that'd be terrible for them. It just makes no sense. I mean, the the, the risk of addiction as the court. We've we've come to a point where the courts will determine whether opioids are going to be available to patients in chronic pain. The, the, the science and the medicine, we're now relying on the courts to uh, use the truth to uh, ensure that patients have access to medication. So these are only two cases we talked about, but is that are they enough to establish a precedent or at least be an example that you know you know if litigation, as you said, is what's driving this, these lawsuits against big pharma companies because there's lots of money in it, could litigation also be the response? Yes, I, I think these two cases. Now the California uh, state court cases will probably be appealed to an appellate court, and but the Supreme Court of Oklahoma has decided that nuisance, public nuisance, the theory of negligence called, uh, or the theory of liability called public negligent, public, public nuisance is not going to be applied to opioids in Oklahoma. They, they've decided that. And it's really a squishy legal theory in the sense that public nuisance has usually historically applied to property. Like if you play music really loud and your neighbor can't enjoy their property, they can sue you for public nuisance or private nuisance in that case. But if you've got a swimming pool that you never clean and it's stagnant and breeds mosquitoes and those mosquitoes are infected, the kids at the public park with malaria or Zika virus, that's a public nuisance. It's usually related to property, but lawyers are always trying to come up with creative legal theories and that's what they've done in this case. But the Oklahoma State Supreme Court case in particular is a huge smackdown to that legal theory. And if I were litigate, if I were the plaintiff litigating those cases in other states, I would be very worried. And I think they are. You know, people in my line of work are not doing a very good job on this story still, even though the information is out there. It's out there. You can find it. All you have to do is look. The percentage of, of chronic pain patients who get addicted is 1% or less. The number of chronic pain patients in pain management who are dying is very, very small, almost non-existent. There are people dying of opioids, but they're drug addicts. We looked at the Nevada, you and I have talked about before, the Clark County coroner's uh, statistics that show, you know, we heard the claim one person is dying in a, of an opioid overdose every day in our state. And we looked at that. We looked at the records. And it's just yeah. not true. Those people are anybody with opioids of any kind in their system is listed as an opioid death. Even those who've got gunshot wounds or died of cirrhosis of the liver or cancer uh, are called opioid deaths. It is ridiculous. And people, my brothers and sisters toiling in the vineyard of the First Amendment are not doing the job to look it up. There was a series in the New York Times just a, a week or so ago where they totally skewed 
the story and left out some very obvious things. There's this dope sick, this book that became a series on Hulu that again repeats all the same stuff. It must be frustrating for you as both a doctor and a lawyer to see this over and over again. It is frustrating, George, but I will tell you that thanks to a handful of people, courageous people, uh, the, the narrative is slowly changing. And now there's an entire army of chronic pain patient advocates who call these people out every time they do it. Every time, what, what's happening is there's a lot of sleight of hand and misrepresentation about the statistics. For example, they will constantly say that prescription opioids have caused so many opioid deaths. But what they, the part they leave out is that, yes, prescription opioids, but they weren't prescribed to that person. They were diverted or they were stolen or they were something else. They weren't legitimately prescribed for a legitimate medical purpose to a chronic pain patient. If you look at, like, as you said, you look at those deaths, it's very small. But these chronic pain advocates are, you know, they are the, uh, they're wounded warriors. I mean, not only do they deal with severe chronic pain on a daily basis now, because their lives depend on it, they are fighting for their legal rights to have access to medication, access to treatment, access to pain psychologists and other types of treatment, physical therapy, et cetera. It's a very difficult thing. But I tell you, it's one of the most miraculous things I've seen that we are making progress and we will continue to push the truth and, and tell the truth about these uh, circumstances. You know, I saw some policy recommendations from the AMA, which I would hope would carry a lot of uh, a lot of weight. But they're they've swung back to sort of the middle ground of, yeah, this is legitimate treatment for chronic pain. We shouldn't make try to make every, all one size fits all for chronic pain patients about the amount, uh, you know, that it is safe to take larger amounts than what is CDC has, has dictated. Any indication that there's a reevaluation by CDC that might, as the last time did, filter down to state governments and boards so we end up, the pendulum swings closer to the middle? It's really hard to tell what's going on at CDC because they are not, in spite of the fact that they're a government agency and they're uh, legally obligated to be uh, to transparency, they're not transparent. They, we still don't know the, the actual circumstances by which uh, these 2016 opioid guidelines were issued. Uh, it, there's a lot of behind the scenes type stuff, uh, but thanks to the chronic pain advocates, these people are being outed in terms of conflicts of interest. Uh, oh yes, I, I have, well, one of the things and I'll call for it again right now, let's have the board of directors of PROP disclose all of the money they've earned as expert witnesses for the past 20 years. Let's see, let's have that done. Let's let, let's shine the light on the motives of these people because the idea is that they're so altruistic and they're so concerned about uh, these opioid deaths and we're all concerned about opioid deaths, but let's see how much money uh, is being generated by your expert witness fees. It's a lot. Can you tell me what it's like for physicians now, for pain management doctors? I, you know, the DEA. You know, you can you can make all kinds of guesses about why uh, so much pressure is put on doctors and and the the role of the big money in suing pharma companies. Why they go after chronic pain patients and pain management doctors? It would seem to me one reason is it's an easy target. It's sitting there. It's a legal business. You don't have to do detective work to go find drug smugglers or cartels. You know that licensed uh, physicians, where they are, you can go after them easy. And, and the DEA has over and over again, and I have great respect for DEA agents I've worked with, go into a community, pick out a doctor, serve a search warrant. They don't have to prosecute them. They don't have to put them in prison. Just serving the search warrant scares the hell out of everyone and will shut a clinic down. And, and the message gets out in that community of pain doctors, right? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, I tell my patients, and I, I can think of two pain doctors in my zip code who are now gone. One's in federal prison, and I don't know what happened to the other one, but it is scary. And I, I am thankful to have a law degree because it allows me to document things very meticulously. And I've never had any issues with uh, the DEA or the Board of Medicine or the Board of Pharmacy. I'm actually quite conservative when it comes to prescribing opioids, but 
I am militant about the fact that they do need to be available. Uh, we don't need to go from, you know, to, to the extreme and exclude them completely. But you're right. The doctors are afraid. And, and there is an arbitrariness to who they pick on. Uh, I think that doctors who are uh, persons of color are susceptible, especially to being picked on by the DEA. I don't know if that's intentionally or it just happens that way, but it is suspicious in my opinion. You wearing your lawyer hat were involved in some litigation that made a pretty strong statement here in Nevada. I wonder, has that message filtered out? Has it become a precedent that is of value to others in the same kind of situation? Uh, that, that case is actually being appealed, of course, <laughs> but uh, yes. And I'm sad to say that in Nevada, we, we see this, this ongoing trend in, in medical malpractice litigation where a patient presents to an ER or they present to a doctor and the, the effect of, of discounting opioids and minimizing their importance, come, the baggage that comes with that is pain is not important. The, the idea that we decide whose pain is important and whose pain is not important has a long, ugly history in America. It started out uh, in, in this times of slavery when people promulgated ideas like uh, African-Americans don't feel pain like white people, they have thicker skin. Um, women are discriminated against with regard to their pain is minimized. And over and over again, we see cases in, in my law practice where a patient presents with pain, they're completely disregarded, especially if it's a woman, and then there's some catastrophic outcome. And then that results in a wrongful death lawsuit or some other kind of lawsuit. And I'm, I'm sad to say that this trend is continuing. The other thing that happens is doctors who are afraid to prescribe opioids will sometimes overprescribe other medications like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen, naproxen, et cetera. They're dangerous drugs. You can have, they, they cause heart attack. They're, they're associated with a higher incidence of myocardial infarction. They're associated with renal failure. They're associated with GI bleed. And when you dose them, when you overdose a patient with that, trying to avoid opioids because you're afraid of the DEA or the Nevada Board of Pharmacy, then the patient is harmed because they get too much toral and they go into kidney failure. It's, it's just a mess with, with consequence after consequence. Is there any indication here in Nevada that things are getting better? I wonder if the state board has heard. We've reported on it a lot. You've made public statements. Some of your colleagues that we both know have been out in front and outspoken about it. Any indication that your messages have been heard at, by our state board? My impression, particularly uh, uh, with regard to the Board of Medicine, the Nevada State Board of Medical Examiners, and the osteopathic medical board that they've actually been quite reasonable. And we did oppose the legislation that the Nevada uh, legislature passed a few years ago. Uh, we predicted that it wouldn't help and it hasn't helped. Opioid overdoses are higher than ever. Uh, it's, it's not done any good as far as I'm concerned, but the board of medicine itself and the board of pharmacy have actually been quite reasonable to date as far as I know. Oh, last question. So, you know, since we started reporting on this uh, issue, many issues uh, some years ago, I've got thousands of messages, letters, emails, social media comments uh, from people who describe their situation and they're, they're so despondent. They have so little hope. Many of them, their, their lives end. They're, they're done. They give up. They just either they, they go out and get uh, street drugs and that kills them. They go out and commit suicide or they stay home, wither and die you know, in silence, suffer in silence. And Americans tend to describe them as whiny and lingerers and lazy, uh, get off off your butt and, and get back to work kind of stuff. That's who we are. Um, is there any hope? Is there a light at the end of the tunnel? What would you say to pain patients around the country who are despondent and ready to give up? Um, what would you say to them? George, there is hope. Um, it, this is a difficult time. And, and as I said before, Chronic pain patients are the were the collateral damage. The patients are the collateral damage in a much bigger fight that's going on. I, I believe that when this opioid litigation has been resolved, that things will cool down. 
But I think that in the interim, we have to preserve the idea that there are a small group of chronic pain patients, a very small percentage of chronic pain patients who are uh, appropriately treated with opioids. That idea is, is key to the legal analysis of these cases. And chronic pain patients have preserved that. Um, and they've done it the hard way and it's been difficult, but we need to continue to preserve that. And chronic pain patients, as hard as it is, um, they do need to get involved politically as, as dirty a game as it is. Uh, we have made progress. These court cases are, I, be I believe the Oklahoma case is a landmark case and I hope it's a turning point. And the, the, when you read the legal analysis and I've read it a few times now, I can't say enough good things about the court that wrote that opinion, but he, he, he understands what's going on. He was able to see through the sleight of hand, the misrepresentation of the statistics. And the only reason, in my opinion, is that chronic pain patients have been loud and vocal and they've used the hashtag our pain in their tweets and they've had Facebook groups and uh, Twitter accounts and everything. So I think chronic pain patients, if we can continue doing that, uh, will continue to move in the right direction. And thank you very much. Appreciate it as always. You're very welcome. Thanks.